Good afternoon. So, already today you've heard quite a lot about particle accelerators, and in particular half of you will have seen and heard about this one. So this is a section of the, uh, the diamond uh, uh, synchrotron, the diamond storage ring. Uh, the other half of you will have heard about this one and maybe seen this one. So this is a section of the ISIS synchrotron. And all of you would have heard about this one. So this is a small section of the, um, the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. So what you may have understood for this is that particle accelerators tend to be large, complicated, expensive things, which are sometimes blue uh, and which are used for, for research. Uh, but what I'm going to show you is that's not true. Most accelerators are much smaller, much less complicated, much cheaper, and are used for applications which we, uh, we use every, uh, every day. Um, so to do th with this, I'm going to start by asking you guys a question. So what I want you to do is to raise your hand if you arrive today in some form of one of these, or maybe given school budgets, one of those. So did you come here today in a car? Five seats, plus or minus a few, a few of you. Uh, what about one of those? There's lots outside. Very good. And one of those. There's one of those outside too. Okay. So the reason I'm asking you this, go back to that, is that 92% of those things, the radial tires on cars, buses, and, um, and such like, use a particle accelerator during the manufacturing process. Nearly all the wires and cables in the engine of a car, other places in the car, and in general, all high specification or high requirement wires and cables use a particle accelerator during the manufacture. And a lot of foam in bumpers, dashboards, seats, and many other areas, again, use a particle accelerator during the manufacturing process. And what these things are used for, what the accelerators are used for, is something called polymer cross-linking. So you're probably aware polymers tend to be one, long one-dimensional structures, so they have no three-dimensional strength. So what you do with cross-linking is create links between these polymer chains, and you increase the strength by typically a, a factor of 1,000. And one of the main ways that this is done is to use an electron beam to create these links between the, the polymer chains. So this is polymer cross-linking. So as well as the, as the things I've already mentioned, it's used for many other things. So it gives shrink wrap, which is used on meat and fish in supermarkets, the certain properties that it has. They're used for improving the strength of component, composites. They're improving, used for improving the strength of service coatings, such as these sort of things on tables, uh, for improving the strength of, of pipes and for giving hydrogels the certain properties that they have, and various other things as well. And this is used a lot. So this actually is the, the third most common use of, um, of particle accelerators. So these are a few examples. These are all different, five different factories in which um, electron beams are used, being used for cross-linking the, the um, surrounds or the, the, yeah, the coatings of, of, of wires. So the accelerator's up there. It does some acceleration. There's a magnet there which spreads the beam in that direction. The, the wires and cables run through the beam and they get treated in the, uh, in the process. For the accelerators themselves, these are two examples on the extreme. So they range in energies from 300 keV, which is this one, which is about that sort of size. So that's the accelerator, and this is the scanning system. And then this is a 5 MeV example. So there's the accelerator. There's a person, so you can see the size. And that's where the, the process is actually done. So you can see these are much, much smaller than the things you've heard about um, today. Uh, so another question. Um, raise your hands if you have one of these. A, some form of smartphone. Almost everybody. Um, and some form of tablet. A laptop, PC, I haven't pressed the button, all the buttons. Well, these things and many others, again, use a particle accelerator uh, during the manufacture. And what the particle accelerator is used for in, this, for in this particular case is a process called iron implantation. So this is implanting ions into various materials to change their properties. And by far the biggest is injecting of ions of things like boron, arsenic, and phosphorus into silicon to make semiconductors. And basically all digital electronics these days is, is iron implanted, and most of it is iron implanted using a, um, an accelerator. But there are also various other uh, reasons that, that this is done. So for the accelerators themselves, they sort of look like this. So you have your source of ions down there. You do a bit of acceleration. You then have a magnet which selects out the particular ion species you want. You do more acceleration, you scan it across the target, and you Im implant the, the ions into that target. So one of these things is um, put into a, 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 a machine like this. So you have your iron source, there's the magnet, there's the acceleration, this is where the iron implantation is. Uh, and then the, the output is presented to the operator who uh, works outside this. Um, so this is what one looks like in reality. And this company that you may be able to make out there, Applied Materials, sell about a billion dollars of these things per year. 
Uh, and there are now more than 10,000 iron implantation accelerators uh, in the country. And there used to be one just over there, actually. Uh, the, the beam energy is typically a few hundred kV, but can go up to 4 um, MeV. And that's the second biggest use of particle accelerators in the world. So in practice, there are nearly 40,000 uh, accelerators being used. About half are less than 5 MeV. Nearly all the rest are less than 20 MeV. So what you've seen today is really out in the, the tails of the energy, energy distribution. So about two-thirds accelerate electrons and a third accelerate ions, including protons, and they're used for, for um, applications in a variety of different, different areas. So essentially all these accelerators now are commercially manufactured, uh, but they are based on technology that was originally developed for, for particle physics. And they're responsible for about half a trillion dollars of uh, commerce per year. So they have a big impact on, uh, on everyday life. So what I'm going to do in the rest of this talk is tell you about the biggest use of particle accelerators, and then I'm going to talk about one of a number of new applications which are being um, developed in the environmental area. So this is the biggest use, and that's for creating beams of ionizing radiation for uh, radiotherapy for, for cancer therapy. So various um, ionizing particles are used, but by far the biggest is, is X-rays. Um, and these are um, created using electron linear accelerator, which use, looks like that. So you have your source of electrons there, electrons come out there, acceleration is done along there. This thing is just over a meter long, about 1.2 meters long. This is the, the power system for that. So this thing is mounted in a gantry, which looks like that. So there's the accelerator, this is the, the power system. So the beam is accelerated in this direction, the X-rays are created there, and I'll talk a bit more about that in a moment, and then delivered to the patient that, that, that lies on the couch. So this thing can rotate by plus or minus 90 degrees, sometime beyond that in the vertical plane. The patient lies on the couch, which can be rotated to the same angle or more in the horizontal plane, and you can also flip the patient over. So this get, that allows you to deliver this beam to the patient basically from any direction to optimize the, the treatment of, of the, the tumor. So in practice, it, one of these things looks like that, and then this is the interesting bit. So the electrons come along here, they go around this thing, which is called an acromat, which basically reduces the energy spread. It gives you the energy you want. Um, that, the, the beam then goes through a, an iris there to reduce the, the transverse spread of the beam, and it hits a heavy metal sheet there, and that's where the X-rays are, are created. And the X-ray beam is then shaped for delivery into the patient using a multi-leaf collimator consisting of tungst tungsten leaves. So you can basically move these things in and out of the beam to absorb the X-rays you don't want and shape the X-ray beam to, um, to the patient. Um, typically, the accelerator energy is 4 to 20 MeV. There aren't many at 20 MeV anymore that are coming down in energy. And there are more than 13,000 of those in, the, in use around the world. So this is the biggest use of particle accelerators. As far as new applications are concerned, there are many which are being developed. Um, but those that I'm working on are in the environmental area. So there's kind of a list of, of these things. Unfortunately, I don't have time to talk about um, all of them. Maybe, fortunately, I don't have time to talk about that one. But the one I am going to talk about is this one. Um, so I imagine when you came here today, you weren't expecting to learn about poo treatment. But actually, this is quite interesting. And it's important, as I'll try and um, demonstrate. Um, so another question. Um, does anybody know what those things might be? Yes? No? Everybody says tapeworms the first time. They're not tapeworms. There's a bit of a hit of the shape. Anybody else want to try? It's interesting. These are actually round worms, comes from the shape. So tapeworms get more PR, if you like, but actually this is a much more serious problem than tapeworms. Uh, and uh, the most, these are actually Ascaris lumbricoides, so these are the biggest form of, tape, of round worms, even I was caught out. So the female can get up to 25 centimetres um, in length. And these things are human parasites. Many forms of Ascaris are human parasites. Uh, but perhaps the most... The important number is, is that it's estimated that 22% of the world population have one form of these or another. Um, and it ranges uh, in the proportions of populations. So in African countries, it's estimated to, to be between 40 and 98% of the country's population. Southeast Asia, around 73%. Central and South America, around 45%. United States, around 2%. UK, less than that. It used to be much larger, but less than that. Uh, and the reason for showing you this is, a, is one way of demonstrating a, about how important it is that, uh, you know, 
we deal with, um, with poo, basically, because that's how these things spread. They tend not to be fatal, um, but the eggs come out in feces, and if the feces are not treated properly, they can end up in, um, in water courses uh, or in food, and they can be ingested, and then the um, uh, roundworm goes around the, the scheme that's shown on there. So treating poo is very important, and not just for that, it's for other reasons as well. So how was this done? Uh, well, in the UK, in many places, a municipal water treatment plant, basically what comes from town, looks like this. So you have the wastewater coming in, the things that shouldn't be there, like plastic bottles, shopping trolleys are removed. They then go through some form of primary treatment, which are these tanks that you may have seen. So basically you have these big settlement tanks where you allow the, um, all of the contamination to settle out from the water. They then usually go through some form of biological treatment, which is normally pumping oxygen through them, so you oxidise the contaminants. And then you do another um, sed sedimentation, so again, to remove the, a lot of the contamination. So what comes out is purer water, which goes into water courses, and everything that you don't want to be in the water is now in the sludge. So this is nasty stuff, because it has all the contamination in it. So that includes bacteria, viruses, parasite eggs. It's a source of antimicrobial resistant gro um, growth. Uh, microplastics end up in there. The water treatment is very good at removing mi microplastics, but that means it puts it in the sludge. Uh, and you'll see what happens to it in a moment. And there's pharmaceuticals, hormones, and everything else is in this, um, in this sludge. So it's difficult to dispose of. And in the UK, up until not so long ago, about 25% about of this stuff was simply dumped at sea to get rid of it. Uh, in Europe, until even more recently, it was actually put into landfill. But both of those things are now illegal. And that is creating problems for certain communities in what they do with it. So that's in the developed world. In the de developing world, it's a major, major source of ill health and death. So fecal contamination probably is the major source of ill health and, and death, and this is a significant contributing factor to fecal contamination. So it's a bad thing, but it's also a very good thing. It's actually a resource which is not being um, fully exploited. So how is it treated? Um, well, in the UK, 90% of it goes through this stuff called this process called anaerobic digestion. Um, the other 10% is incinerated, which is crazy. Um, so in anaerobic digestion, what you do is you use bacteria in the absence of, of oxygen to digest the, um, the stuff. So what happens there is that typically it runs at 35 to 39 degrees. Some forms are much higher temperature than that. So that kills off most of the contamination um, in the sludge. It takes a while to do that. And in the process, it gives you two good things. One of the good things is biogas. So this is a mixture of carbon dioxide and methane. So you can then burn that for generating heat and electricity. Um, in all but one case in the UK, that's actually done just to generate heat and power for the, the water treatment plant. It's not, it doesn't actually get out in, into the grid. And the efficiency in a standard anaerobic digestion is very, the digester is very poor. It's only around um, 10%. The other thing that comes out is cleaner, less contaminated uh, fertilizer in inverted um, commas. So this stuff is still contaminated, um, so it's still waste. It's not actually a fertilizer. Um, most of it ends up on um, farm fields. Um, and indeed, that smell that well, was one earlier on, that you can often hear a smell around um, farms, which is often attributed to, attributed to pigs and cows and other things, isn't actually any of those. It's a different form of animal. And um, because it's contaminated, there are, are restrictions on how it can be used, in particular for food uh, production. So as well as being a problem, this sludge is a potential you know, resource which is not being fully exploited. So that's where electric, electron accelerators come in. They can be used for, for water treatment, but what we're focusing is on treating the sludge either before anaerobic digestion or after anaerobic digestion. Uh, and both of those things um, have advantages. So if you do it before anaerobic digestion, what it does is break down the longer chain organic molecules in the, in the sludge, so it makes it more digestible. And the result of that is that the efficiency of uh, biogas production goes up by at least a factor of two, uh, and the whole process, it, process is much faster. So with the same facility, you can allow for population growth because you can treat more um, sludge. If you do it afterwards, then the efficiency with which it kills off the, the pathogens is much higher than standard anaerobic digestion. And it looks likely that this stuff after anaerobic digestion will be, can be classified as fertilizer and not waste. So it removes the constrictions, restrictions which are currently applied. It also uh, inactivates parasite over, so no more problems with, um, with roundworm, 
it breaks down pharmaceuticals, it breaks down personal care products, it breaks down a lot of the stuff that's, that's in there. So there are production plants in, it, there have been a number of pilot plants, pilot, pilot studies of this. Uh, there's production plants being built in Poland, there are uh, sorts of production plants being built in, in China. And as far as pharmaceutical, uh, sorry, microplastics um, are concerned, we also believe there's the first indications that they would, can, electron beams can remove microplastics from, uh, uh, from, from the site. Otherwise, it ends up on fields and it can, it can end up in, uh, in food. So that's basically all, all the time I, I have to, to talk about these things. But what I hope I've shown you today is that excitors are very important for things make, other than just making Higgses. They have an impact on everyday life. They're used extensively. There are new applications they can be used for. It just takes some time and effort to, to, to develop those. Uh, and, and if you want more information, there are various sources of the, um, of the new information. Thank you.